Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jorge Muñoz, and along with Adrián de la Rocha, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, iron vanadium at simultaneous high temperature and high pressure from classical uh, molecular dynamics. And I hope that you don't mind the slight change in material and the generation of the data. The rest of the, uh, the structure is the same. So this work uh, was, was with uh, Vanessa Meraz, Armando Garcia, and Bethel Hamala from UTEP, Yuhang Tang, and Bertie Jong from Berkeley Lab. So today we're going to talk about the born hutton lattice dynamics model um, a little bit. And I'm going to give you some details about the phonons in the iron vanadium system and um, about its lattice uh, mechanical stability. And then we're going to, Adrian is going to talk to you about the harmonic ensemble lattice dynamics method, which is a method that we have developed to study uh, phonon dispersions at both high pressure and elevated temperature. And we're going to talk about the fight between quasi-harmonicity and anharmonicity in iron vanadium and how they affect the thermal stability of the material of the B2 phase. And we're going to bring you some conclusions. So all measurable thermodynamic quantities at a given volume and temperature can be extracted from the Helmholtz free energy. But in order to compute this quantity, you need uh, accurate phonon spectra at finite temperature. And this is still pretty difficult to, uh, to get computationally. You require a lot of computation. And although the techniques are getting a little bit uh, easier to use. So the quasi-harmonic model has been used uh, to simulate the effect of temperature uh, by a, uh, introducing a, an explicit volume dependence. But uh, the problem is that quasi-harmonic, uh, quasi-harmonicity is not a low order theory of anharmonicity. In fact, they are uh, different effects. And we're going to show you here how sometimes they uh, actually act against each other. So over here, we have the phonon frequencies. And we see that the quasi-harmonicity and the anharmonicity can both uh, shift the frequencies. So um, this part over here depends only on the, on the volume at constant temperature. And this part over here depends only on the temperature at constant volume. So this one is the um, anharmonic part. This is the quasi-harmonic part. So Max Born uh, came up with his uh, famous model. So the, the born von Karman lattice dynamics model. And Hutton was one of his uh, PhD students. Uh, Hutton came up with a, I guess the, a qualitative explanation of, of why the born von Karman model works. And so he realized that um, over here, you know, in the, at the bottom of a potential, it looks pretty much like a parabola. But if there's strong anharmonicity, such as in the case of um, solid helium, then this is not a parabola anymore. It looks more like a sombrero potential. But as the atoms start vibrating, uh, they're going to explore a wider space. And so on average, this will start looking like a parabola again. So uh, most models uh, right you know, nowadays they're going to fit, they're going to find the parameter that is the best fit to this uh, approximate parabola. Uh, they, might in, they might have uh, higher order terms, you know, uh, cubic and quartic. Uh, so that is going to make the fit better, but uh, it is still a fit. So what we're doing instead is to look at the potential at different time steps. And, you know, at each time step, it looks a little bit different. And so uh, we get dispersions, uh, well, for, uh, force constants and dispersions from that. And the dispersions might look a little bit funky uh, at a given uh, snapshot, at a given time step. But, but by aggregating all of them, uh, we recover um, the, uh, the correct dispersions and they actually have a broadening. So over here, we have the phonons of the B2 order phase of iron vanadium. And uh, you can see over here that at a pressure of about 9.4 uh, gigapascals, so a lattice parameter of 2.83, uh, 
uh, this, uh, this part over here becomes uh, imaginary. And if you continue compressing the sample, actually this whole branch becomes uh, imaginary. These are density functional theory results at zero Kelvin. Over here, we have uh, experimental uh, phonon density of states uh, using neutrons and x-rays of uh, iron vanadium. And one of the uh, quirky things about this material is that in the order phase, uh, the phonons are softer than in the disorder um, iron vanadium phase. Uh, Adrian? Um, so first I begin to talk about the general description of what the von Brockerman model does. Um, this model basically assigns a matrix of force constants for a v pair of atoms i, j. Uh, this matrix is below uh, the d i, j. Uh, and in general, this works uh, sort of like a generalization of Hooke's law to three dimensions, right? Which I have in the first equation. Um, to get the interaction between two atoms, or the way the interaction is described through this matrix, is the force vector, which in this case I have the force vector on I due to the movement of J is equal to the matrix times the displacements from equilibrium of J in X, Y, and C, which make the full vector of displacement. Um, another way of looking uh, the results from this model is the equation that I have on the bottom where the total force acting on I in the direction of A is equal to the sum of uh, all of the atoms J that it interacts with over all of the dimensions uh, B. Uh, a and B are placeholders from X, Y, and C. And in the diagram, the diagram to the left, I picture the correlation between say the movement of J in the direction of B and how this affects uh, the force in I in the direction of A and how that will be basically described by the element AB of the matrix uh, DIJ. Yeah. So first we need to talk about how these matrices look for the cases that we're considering. We're considering up to fifth nearest neighbors, all the way from uh, zero to nearest neighbor. On the top, I have an illustration of the BCC structure. In our case, we're working with B2, which is BCC based. So simply color coding um, when the material is ordered, we could say the green or blue atoms are iron and the purple ones are vanadium, to put an example. Then in the coordination shell that I have below, um, I show an example of the matrix for uh, one nearest neighbor of each type. So then I have the vector that describes the position of let's say the atom J with respect to, to our reference atom I, um, where A is the lattice parameter, which is just basically the side of the cube that we have drawn above. And if you pay attention to the maths, you see it's easy to find them in the picture above. Um, then the matrix below is just the one corresponding from the interaction between these two atoms. These matrices are symmetrical and the matrix IJ is equal to the JI. Um, then to account for different geometries that the same type of nearest neighbors might have, we apply two transformation rules that are equivalent to octahedral symmetry operations. The first one um, is a replacement for permutation matrices. The second one is a replacement for reflection. Uh, what I show in the first one is basically um, switching around two values of the position vector of J with respect to I uh, will cause for the row and the column corresponding to that those two positions to switch. And in the case of the second transformation rule, if we change the sign of one of these uh, components of the vector, we must change the sign of the corresponding row and the corresponding column. This uh, is equivalent and can also be solved with uh, rotation matrices, which is uh, the example that I show on the right. Now we look at the general, uh, or to expand this idea and see how it looks with 
actual uh, our, our actual examples of the near neighbors. Um, if we use the first equation that I show, we see that the total force uh, due to the four nearest neighbors acting on atom I in each of the directions X, Y, and C is described by these equations. Um, it's easy to see that since there are no terms that vanish in the fourth nearest neighbors matrix, there, there are no zeros basically. Um, this is basically arranged in the same order as the matrix di dictates, right? Uh, from here, it's easy to abstract that the total force acting on a uh, given, uh, given atom I in the direction of uh, X, Y, or C can be described as a linear sum of all of our different values of um, force constants. So in this case, we have 14. This is the case for BCC, simple BCC. Um, and these can then give us a system of equations that I put as a matrix product that is on the lower corner. Uh, the second thing to consider is the second equation that I have on the middle here, the, which is a translation constraint. And it simply says that all of the elements sharing a position AB over the, the different atoms J with respect to an, an I must add up to zero. Um, because of the symmetry of the system, this ends up being just one equation, which I have as the last row of the matrix product. Um, then these can be applied to a single time step, which is the case that I was just explaining, or it can be done simultaneously for all time steps uh, given by the simulation. Um, this, the second uh, example, is equivalent to a method that has already been worked before, the temperature dependent uh, effective potential by Ole Hellman, um, did the EP. And here are how the matrices look and like the, the size. Um, because the U matrix is not a square matrix, uh, if we want to solve uh, the algebra that I have on the first equation to the left, we must instead calculate its small Penrose pseudo inverse. This will make uh, our results be a, um, a linear fit basically of the system that we, we have. Um, this uh, system must be extended to account for more force constants in the case of PCC based, like it's a case of iron vanadium, because some symmetries are lost. In that case, there are more types of interactions. And uh, as Jorge points out here, um, basically the difference between our method and, and TDEP is that we mostly work uh, with the individual time steps. And what we show in this presentation is all from those calculations. Uh, Another alternative to calculating the inverse is shown in the second equation, where we basically multiply times the transpose of u, giving us a square matrix for which we can actually calculate the inverse and might be computationally uh, more efficient. So here we have some results. At 10 Kelvin, we can see that the distribution of force constants is pretty narrow. As you increase the temperature to 300 Kelvin over here, the distributions understandably uh, become wider. And that's because the uh, phase space of the um, configurations of the atoms increases. One of the um, main observations over here is that at 10 Kelvin and a volume of 2.84 angstrom, this uh, phase is not uh, stable, so it's mechanically unstable. And what we see is that all the secondary neighbors force constants become positive, while in the situ the cases in which it is uh, stable, the uh, a set of secondary neighbors, so the the tr transfers uh, are negative, while the longitudinal are positive. So these are the, the main results of this study. So you can see that as you decrease the volume in, in this direction, then this mode over here, the M5, goes down in energy. Over here, it becomes imaginary. Uh, over here, it remains imaginary. As you increase the 
temperature in this direction, but keeping the volume constant, the same mode, the M5 increases in energy. And so temperature stabilizes this mode, but uh, decreased volume D stabilizes it. And so we can draw a, a boundary for the stability of this system at around here. So these ones over here are unstable and the rest over here are stable. So here we have a cut along the endpoint, the uh, high symmetry point, and the different colors are the different temperatures. So black is 10 Kelvin and the light green is uh, 1500 Kelvin. And what we can see is that as the temperature increases, uh, the modes you know, move to higher frequencies. But as the volume is compressed in this direction, then uh, these two, well, the uh, transverse optical M5 and this combined M2 and M3 form modes, they move to higher uh, energies, which is what you expect from most materials. But the transverse M5, uh, it goes to lower energies, which is not typical. And so we're quantifying that over here. The Grunison parameter is, uh, is negative and it's large about an order of magnitude, but you will expect in most materials, it is about two. This is the anharmonic part of it, the, the anharmonic shift. And you can see that it's in the opposite direction as the quasi-harmonic shift. And it's also an order of magnitude sometimes uh, higher than for the other two modes. So in this case, uh, both of them, uh, all of them increase their energy or their frequency with temperature, but the TA M5 increases more. And of course the uh, quasi harmonic is against it. So we have uh, these components of the equation. So, over here we have uh, 2.86, which is uh, always stable and 2.82 in which it's unstable depending on the temperature. So for uh, these temperatures over here, you can see that the longitudinal force constants over here became um, negative. And so what that does is that, well, this is the M5 phone mode displacement pattern. Uh, if those forces are positive, then it's gonna displace this way, but then it's gonna feel a force in this direction and in this direction, and so it's gonna go back. But uh, if those are negative, then uh, it's just going to continue in the direction in which it was moving, and it's going to uh, make the cubic phase uh, unstable. So in conclusion, health is a natural extension to the born hood and lattice dynamics model and is capable of reproducing quasi-harmonic and anharmonic phonon frequency shifts. It might also be capable of reproducing anharmonic burning, although we have not studied this in detail, but the numbers are kind of in the same ballpark, in the correct ballpark. Uh, we reproduce a mechanical instability with volume compression, and we predict that the phase, the V2 phase is going to be stabilized by anharmonicity at higher temperatures. And the main culprit is this transverse acoustic M5 phonon mode that is very sensitive to changes in volume and temperature. So quasi-harmonicity stabilizes the mode while anharmonicity stabilizes it. Thank you. Thank you.